Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Pat Johnson, and he's in Texas, and he has a near-death experience that is very interesting to me because I drowned when I was five, so I really am interested in the drowning stories, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you, I guess, to tell my story, um, I was, uh, this was in 2010, and uh, at the time, I guess I was, let me see, I think it was 52, and uh, I was just a, you know, had kids, wife, grandkids, and owned a business, and and just, uh, you know, living a regular average life, I guess you'd say, and um, we lived on the Blanco River between San Antonio and Austin up in the, in the Texas Hill Country, and on the river that we lived on, um, it would flood usually, uh, I don't know, anywhere from two to five times a year, maybe six or seven if it was a really wet year. And um, normally we'd wait a couple of days for the river to go back down after it after it come out of its banks and give it a couple of days to go down and clear up. And that was when we liked to kayak because the river was still a couple of feet, feet above normal and it was running really good. But it was it was safe enough and clear enough to uh, to go. And um, this particular uh, week, we had had like six or seven inches of rain and the, and the river came out of its bank and it was just perfect for, you know, what we what we like to kayak conditions we like to kayak in. And so I typically went from this little town of Wimberley back to my house, which was a two and a half, three hour kayak trip. And um, and I'd only done it a couple of times before I'd gone from my house down to the next town below us, San Marcos which was a longer trip. That was about a six hour trip. And um, I wanted to do it because, because the river was really, you know, it was really moving good. And I called around and I finally found a, a lifelong friend of mine, uh, Bobby Humphreys that um, agreed to come down. He was working at the South pole at the time and, and he was fixing to leave like the following week. And so he was going to come down and we were going to kayak, spend, spend the night. We're going to kayak and, uh, Last time I'd seen him for a few months when he went went off to work. And um, anyway, we left out on a Sunday morning. It was uh, September 12, 2010. And um, we took shuttled one vehicle down river and uh, parked it so we'd have a ride back when we got down to uh, the, the town below us. And um, we came back up to, our, to my house to put in the river. And uh, as we're leaving, we're just kind of joking around. And I told my wife, I was like, oh, by the way, uh, anything happens, the the life insurance policies are in the nightstand. And, I, and she's like, oh, why'd you say that? And I was like, oh, you know, I don't know why I said that. That was a bad attempt at a joke. But um, anyway, so it was about 11 o'clock in the morning. We made our way down to the river and took off. And we were having a great time. I mean, you know, the water was really, really flowing well. And there was a couple of places where we, um, shot these rapids and would portage back up and do it two or three times because the, the water was flowing so well. And, um, and anyway, just goofing around, having a good, great day. Um, and we get to about two thirds, three quarters of the way through the trip, we get to this low water crossing and it's, uh, it's a, a pretty high low water crossing bridge. And uh, if you can kind of visualize the top of it was kind of like the top of a castle where it was, these blocks that were about six or eight inches tall and they were maybe a foot to 16 inches wide. And then there would be a space in between them. And it was on both sides of the bridge. And basically that's to, you know, to keep a vehicle from sliding off the bridge when it's going across the bridge, if there's water flowing. Like battlements? Yeah. 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 Kind of like a, like the wall, you know, where I guess the, in the old castles where they position themselves in between the blocks. So my friend, Bobby, he goes across the bridge in front of me and the water is about eight or nine inches above the, uh, going across the top of the bridge. And, um, he goes across in front of me and the front of his kayak hits one of the, one of the blocks and the current turns his kayak sideways. And so when that happened, I came up behind him and I just broadsided him and hit him, you know, and just goofing around, you know, like get your ass out of the way. Come on, what's going on? And, you know, just having fun. So then I just pushed myself backwards. And as I do that, I'm just planning on moving over, scooting over and going around him and dropping off the dropping off the edge of the bridge and uh, keep on going. Well, anyway, as I backed up uh, to go around him, I started to go around him 
and I couldn't move to the side because the back end of my kayak was was caught between two of the two of the blocks. So I just pushed myself completely off the bridge, and um, and I just figured I'd scoot over and and go across the bridge, drop off, and just keep on going. You know, no no big deal. So as as I start to go across the bridge, I'm on the upriver side of the bridge, and it's real flat and calm there because the water was backed up, and it was a real wide part of the river. And um, my kayak hit one of the blocks on the upriver side of the bridge, and the current turned me sideways. So I'm thinking, you know, no big deal. I'll just, you know, be turned sideways, and I'll uh, the side of my kayak will probably hit the blocks and tip tip up, and I'll fall out of the kayak, and I'll just pull my kayak over the shallower part of the river and get back in and keep going <clears throat> and anyway everything kind of happened like that like I figured it would and when I fell off in the water I got about not quite waist deep and uh I just this powerful just it, it felt like somebody wrapped a cable around my ankles and just jerked me under the water it was super strong and so I was being pulled under you know drug under the water and a few years early, earlier, I'd, uh, I'd been near one of these low water crossings, walking in front of it. It was a much lower crossing than this one. And uh, there was washout underneath the, the low water bridge, and it sucked my leg into it. So I thought that's what was happening. I thought there was a, a washout under the bridge, and I was being pulled into it. And uh, I was just waiting for my feet to hit something solid because I couldn't, I couldn't pull myself out. You know, I, I couldn't, obviously, I couldn't swim against that current. And um, about that time, while I'm, you know, while I'm being sucked under, I feel these bumps on the tops of my hands. And I realized immediately I was being, I was in a corrugated pipe. I felt, you know, the, I just knew from the, the way the bumps wow. felt on the backs of my hands, I was in corrugated pipe. So I forced my feet down and I forced my hands up and I was able to stop myself inside the pipe. And um, the water was still pretty murky, but, you know, from the flood, but um, as as a teenager, we used to shoot some of these pipes, but we would never go through one that was completely full of water. You know, it usually, usually had uh, like, a, you know, uh, some air level in it. And uh, we'd run an inner tube through it to make sure it was clear before we'd go through, you know, make sure there wasn't any T-post or, or uh, branches or stones or barbed wire or anything like that that was obstructing the pipe, you know. And um, I probably was like eight or 10 feet back into the pipe and I could see behind, I could see over my shoulder behind me, it was just black. And in front of me, I could see the light from where I came in the pipe. So I'm, I thought to myself, well, if I let go and I, and I get hung up on the, on the back end of the pipe, you know, if there's anything, any obstruction back there and I can't get through the pipe, completely through the pipe, I'm, I'm going to die. So I just started moving forward. I mean, just tiny little steps, three, four inches at a time just started pushing forward and the whole time I'm just thinking about my wife and I'm thinking about my kids and I'm praying and uh, I'm just trying to trying to stay alive and that's it I really don't have any other you know any other thoughts you know and my my senses were you know were heightened I could see tiny little grains of uh, sand as they you know went by my by my face I could I felt like I could feel every drop of water going across my body I could was you could, was your face underwater at that point oh yeah the the pipe that I got sucked into was three or four feet underwater yeah I was I was completely submerged the whole time and um you know I could hear every little sound I mean you know um it, it's amazing how quickly your how quick your brain can calculate things when you're in a situation like that you know i always think about when people talk about being in car wrecks how everything was in slow motion and you can literally have conscious thoughts in milliseconds you know it's it's amazing and so i'm i'm moving forward and i get to the front of the pipe and i put my hands on the outside of it uh, around the edges of it and i try to push myself out but i can't i can't get any major part of my body i i can't get out the water was stronger at the front of the pipe than it was in the pipe even though it was strong there too and uh about this time i see my friend bobby who's on top of the bridge i see his hand coming through the water down towards me and what had happened was is he was looking uh away from me when i when i fell off the kayak and got sucked in and so when he turned back around to look towards me i, I wasn't there and he thought i was on the other side of the kayak just playing a joke on him or something 
And then he he was on the downriver side of the bridge, so he could see the pipes coming out. I couldn't I didn't know there were pipes where I was at. And uh, he saw my paddle shoot through one of the pipes. So he knew I, I was stuck in one of the pipes. And there happened to be four of them. And he's up on top of the bridge while I'm underwater going, pacing back and forth, uh, you know, trying to, you know, trying to see if anything happened or if I, he could see me or whatever. So he saw my hands wrap around the outside of the pipe and he got on his hands and knees up on top of the bridge and uh, reached down towards me. And we grabbed hands and I always tell people that uh there's nothing that replaces a sensation of touching, physically touching another person. I didn't feel alone. It gave me hope. I mean, there, there's no replacement for it. I mean, you can talk to somebody on the phone. We, we're chit-chatting on Zoom. It's not the same as if I'm giving you a hug, you know. And so um, I uh, I thought, ah, oh, this is it. You know, I just need this little extra pull and I'm out of here. So I jerked on Bobby's hand. And when I did, our hands came apart and I lost my grip with my left hand and I got pulled back into the pipe, but not quite as far this time, maybe about six feet and before I could stop myself. And uh, I thought, well, you know, uh, man, I, I know I can get to the front of the pipe because I've already done it once, but I don't know how much longer I can stay underwater because I, I was really desperate for for breath, a breath of air at that time. So I started moving forward and I made it about two feet and I just felt like I was encapsulated by this, uh, like a bubble or, or, or just being in an egg, in an eggshell, you know, just felt, felt surrounded in the, and the, the sound got quieter. I didn't feel the water on my body. And it just, I just, this, this overwhelming peace came over me. And just, in, just in an instant, I, I felt, you know, I had this sensation that Everything was right in the world. There was nothing, nothing, no need to worry about anything. That was everything was where it was supposed to be. And then, and you, then I, do you think you oh, held your breath so long that you succumbed that way? You know, like when I was drowning, I was screaming underwater. So, you know, I was choking everything, but you're holding your breath. You know, you can't breathe. You, and then you're, you're gone. You know, you didn't have that moment of swallowing water and, no. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, you know, I, de obviously I wanted a breath of air, but um, for whatever reason, and I, uh, I was told later that it, it, it's kind of a, a natural, kind of an instinct that you, you hold your, your, you know, your body uh, fights you sucking in the water like that to breathe in the water. So, um, no, and and I, as soon as I had this sensation of just this total peace and nothing to worry about. And I was totally calm as soon as as soon as I had that that sensation, I I, I uh, lost consciousness. And when I lost consciousness, I never felt like I was, you know, woozy or hallucinating. I, I, I felt coherent the whole time. And so when I lost consciousness, just immediately uh, I was in, you know, I was in another place. And um, the I was it was like I was looking down this hallway or cave maybe 75 yards long. And there was this blue stained glass, kind of similar to the glass behind your head, but it was a solid color. And kind of to the bottom right-hand corner of it, there was a hole through it with this bright, bright white light. And there were kind of rays coming off of it at different angles. And the hole in the glass wasn't, it wasn't round. It was like somebody had thrown a rock through it. So it had these edges to it. And that bright white light was kind of shining with some beams coming off of it where the edges were. And to my left, it was this um, this kind of a, it, uh, rough, not maybe not rough, but rigid, like a like a cave would be. And and above me, it was the same way, but it was it was real soft, like like it was covered with felt. And and then the floor was like a black black marble with those rays of light reflecting off of it. And out to my right, it was just like it was endless darkness, just like I could st stick my arm out there and and it it'd disappear, you know. But immediately immediately i my first thought was man you got to be really bad not to get here because i didn't feel like i was that good a person and and i felt like i was i was where i was supposed to be and, and the reason i had that thought was because i just felt connected to multitudes billions of souls i can't even put a number to it i just felt connected i don't i didn't see them I, I can't even explain it i just i just knew it and uh 
And the next, the next thought I had right after that, I, I felt like I could just look over my shoulder and my wife and kids would, would be coming in behind me. Felt like they were right behind me. And I, I kind of attribute that to the, the difference in the relationship to time that we have here compared to there. And, um, and I wanted to get to this light. I was just being drawn slowly to the light. I didn't I had no sensation of a body. It was like beyond relaxation. You know, I don't even like I'm relaxed right now, but I can still feel my shirt touching my skin. I had no sense of, of, of any, any body part that was, that was, or any pain or in any sensation that you would have physically. And looking down at the light, it kind of looked, kind of had this kaleidoscope effect. And as I got closer to the light, um, I was being drawn to it. I wanted to get to it, but I, I was just being drawn to it slowly. It was like my, I wasn't in control of my my movement. Like so, as I, you mean like like a kaleidoscope, like it kind of moves and in, in and out of. Yeah, just kind of just the yeah, just the the, the variation in the in the uh, brightness of, or, or what you know, and just kind of uh, like little flashes from different angles. And as I was being drawn to the light, as I got closer, what was made, what was given at that effect was there were people walking back and forth in front of it at different angles, and and uh, and I mean I could see the silhouettes, and it was it was human beings, and and I wanted to I wanted to see who they were, you know, in case I in case it was somebody that that I that I knew or a relative or my you know maybe my parents or something, you know, and. Uh, I, I was getting almost close enough to to identify who they were, and and that's when I regained consciousness. But the light was so white and so bright coming through that coming through that glass through that hole in the glass. All I, all I could ever make out was just the silhouettes of the people. I could not I couldn't identify who they were. And um, the next thing I knew was um, I was I was in this water about four inches deep, four or five inches deep in these small rocks, kind of river rocks. And, and my face was going down towards the rocks and then back up and then down towards the rocks and back up. And what had happened was, is when I lost consciousness, I got pushed out of the pipe and the rapids were pretty big that day. So I was tumbling through the rapids and my buddy was able to jump off the bridge and I don't know how he did it, but somehow he was able to uh, catch up to me. Uh, probably 60, 70 yards down the river from the bridge. And he was able to pull me to the to the edge of the water, to the edge of the river where it was shallow. And he didn't know how to do CPR. So he rolled me on my stomach and he straddled me from behind. And he put his arms kind of around the lower part of my chest. And he just started lifting me up and down, up and down. And it and it worked. It resuscitated. Like body slamming you? <laughs> no, it was it wasn't a hard slam, but yeah, I guess yeah, he was lifting me up pretty hard and let me down, lift me up and let me down, and 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 uh, I've been I've been told by EMTs and doctors that 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 was like one in ten million that that would have ever worked, or you know that I would have been resuscitated that way. But when he when he caught up to me, he said my face was purple, my eyes were fixed open, and my face was swollen, and. Um, and he was able to drag me to that. And he said the whole time he was trying to keep my head out of the water, but he said, I kept flipping over. And so he drug me through the water to, to a point where he could do that. And the first sensation I had again was, was his arms touching me, the touch of another person, which is, you know, was critical. And, um, and then the second sensation I had was just the air touching my face. And, and it just uh, felt great. And I, pulled my hands and my feet up under my knees up underneath me and my hands underneath me. When I did that, it took the weight off his hands and, and he knew I was conscious and he just rolled me over and he started hugging me and kissing me and he was crying and he was telling me, love me. And then he started yelling at me and cussing me out. And then he started telling me, love me. And he was, he, he was in shock. I mean, he was in way worse shape than I was. He and, saved uh, your the, life. Yeah. Yeah. He said the whole time, all he could think about was, was was coming back to my house and telling my wife that I died. And he said that's the only thing that he just kept thinking that over and over again. And so when I when I regained consciousness, it was you know huge relief for him. And um, uh, you know I, I, after that, after a few minutes of that, I was able to crawl up on the bank and I and I, and I coughed a little bit of water. Surprisingly, I didn't maybe three mouthfuls of water. Surprisingly, I didn't have very little uh, 
water in my lungs, but I had a, a lot of water in my sinuses. Man, it felt like water was coming out my nose. It was running out my nose. It was running out my ears. It was, uh, it felt like it was coming out my eyeballs. I mean, it, I was just, mm-hmm. and my head felt, I had this tremendous headache. It felt like somebody had hit me in the head with a baseball bat. And I could only take these short little breaths. I couldn't take a normal breath. So my chest was hurting and my head was hurting. And I crawled up on the bank and I rolled over. And it was this real, the sky was really pretty that day. It was kind of a baby blue sky with these little white puffy cotton looking clouds floating across. And I looked up and it looked like every cloud was illuminated. It was like I was seeing the sky for the first time. It was amazing. I was just like, I was in awe. And I just laid there just in amazement at how beautiful the sky was. And, you know, I never in my life had, had, had seen the sky that, that was that brilliant and that pretty. And uh, never had I seen clouds that, that looked like they were lit up. And so, um, and, you know, I laid there and it took me a few minutes to get myself back together. And then I felt like I could feel the, I felt like I was connected to the, to the trees and the grass and, everything around me I just felt connected I I felt like I could almost feel the sap flowing through trees if you can imagine that and um, then we had to we still we still were about an hour and 45 minutes we're in the middle of these big ranches so there's nobody around so we still had about an hour and 45 minutes to go down the river to get back to our vehicle and there was you know we didn't have a cell phone with us or anything so there was no way to uh, you know to to get in touch with anybody so anyway um we, uh, my paddle, since it had gone down river, we had to split my Bobby's paddle in two and he used half of it. And I used half of it. And we started down river and maybe 10 minutes down river, we ran into my paddle up against the bank. So got my paddle back. And then we went another five or 10 minutes. And I saw this, um, cowbird or an egret, white egret. And it was flying from the left to the right across the river. And there's these, these huge cypress trees that, you know, they're 80 to hundred foot cypress trees that line the banks of the, the Blanco river down here. And, um, this Ingrid, it flew across the river in front of me and it was, it was illuminated too, like the clouds. It looked like it was glowing and it landed in this tree next to the river. And, you know, I just looked at it and I was just, I was just totally blown away. And, um, I just asked God, I said, you know, God, you know, let this always be your story. Don't let me embellish it. Don't let me add to it or take away from it. Let this, let me be true to this. And, 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 you know, this is, this is all about you. And Were you telling um, Bobby what was going on during that no, time? No. And after I prayed, after I prayed, I told Bobby, I said, I said, man, you're going to think I'm crazy. But uh, I said, man, I was just in this beautiful place. I mean, it was beautiful. And, uh, uh, at one point I did, when he was cussing at me, I didn't tell him that I, where I'd been or what I'd seen, but I did make the comment to him, to him when he was cussing at me and hugging me that, um, uh, I don't think he should talk like that because I, I was, I feel like I was just in the presence of God. And I felt very sensitive to that at the time, at that moment. And so I did make that one comment to him then, but I, you know, he, he didn't, he didn't catch it. And, and, uh, it felt, you know, I think he might have thought it was out of place. I don't know. But anyway, then af- after, you know, 20 minutes down the river, I prayed. And uh, and I told him, I said, man, I, I was just in this awesome, beautiful place. And I told him, I said, man, it, it was just spectacular. I said, man, I'm glad this happened to me. He's like, what? Uh, you know, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't understand it. And uh, anyway, I just told him, I said, yeah, I, I was in the presence of God and and I just, I just feel clean. I felt for, I felt forgiven. And I felt, felt this, un, you know, this love that was so, it was total. When people say unconditional love, uh, that didn't even, that didn't even describe it. It was like a love that didn't exclude any part of you, good or bad. You know, it was total love just for everything that you are, you know, just the way you are. I mean, because I always think about it too. It's like, oh, you know, your parents love you. You love your kids and stuff. But there's always that, there's always that, but, you know, I love him to death, but, you know, he kind of annoys me when he does this, you know, but it wasn't like that. It was like it, with annoyances and everything, I just felt this complete love, you know, and this, and this clean, forgiven, 
feeling, you know, like all, all my issues and hangups were just kind of were, were wiped away. And um, so then we make it back, finally make it back to our vehicle. We drive back home and my wife is waiting on us and we walk in the house and we both kind of have our heads down trying to process this whole afternoon. And uh, my wife says, you know, what's the matter? What's the matter? And I just walked in the bedroom and Bobby stayed in the, in the kitchen with her. And he just started crying. And he's like, pal, we almost lost Pat today. He, you know, he drowned and I had to resuscitate him and he got anyway. And so then she came in in the bedroom and we hugged and we told her what happened. And we cried and, you know, and, and it was, it was emotional. And then, um, you know, I, I kind of knew right away that things were always, everything was going to be different. I, you know, just I felt different about everything. And um, we hadn't eaten all day. So we went in, went into town and went to this uh, barbecue restaurant. And I remember walking in and there was probably 10 or 15 people in there. And it was so weird. My, my sense of, of hearing was heightened and I could hear, you know, two or three different conversations going on at one time. And, and I felt like I could see an aura around people. I felt like I could see people's souls and it was almost tangible. Like I could reach out and touch it. And, and this went on for a couple of months. And so anywhere, anywhere in time I was in a public place, I felt like I could see people's souls. And, and then, you know, I, I, I went to church and I hear a scripture it was like I was hearing it for the first time. And it was like I was, I've heard it a hundred, five hundred times. And it was like I understood it for the first time. And man, I just get emotional and start crying. I just uncontrollably be just crying through a church service, you know. And I would see people and I was like, uh, you know, one of the things that I came back with that I felt like, you know, that God was, you know, desperately trying to get everybody in heaven. And the, the way we, you know, the way we judged people and the way we saw people was not the same way that God looks at us. And so I would see people that were, you know, that I might have probably ignored or, or not given any attention to before. And I looked at them as, you know, as if they were as important as anybody. And then I'd see some people that I might have been uh, impressed with before. And, I, and, and the not that their value went down. But some of the things like what they were driving or, uh, you know, just the way the job they might have had or whatever. It, it, sometimes if they were kind of uh, cocky and a little bit arrogant, I would just laugh. You know, it was just funny to me because I didn't think that they were uh, that, that the reasons they thought they were important were were really important to me. And so all this stuff was going on. And people kept coming up to me telling me, you know, hey, you know, it's it's great that your friend Bobby was there to save you and just wasn't your time, man. You're so lucky and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'd say, yeah, 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 you know, you're right, you're right. I was just really happy everything turned out the way it did. And after a couple of weeks, I told my wife, I was like, I was like, uh, you know, everybody's telling me this. And and I'm and I say, yeah, thank you and appreciate it and everything. But I told her, I said, man, don't take this a long way. But what I really want to tell people is if I wouldn't have come back, it would have been okay. I was in this beautiful place and it was, it was sensational. And, and I, I would have, I would have been fine staying there. And then um, I said, and then I told her, I said, you know, I don't want to talk to a psychiatrist or a counselor, but I need to talk to somebody because I was really, I was really freaking out because I mean, here I am a, a guy in his early fifties with a family and a business, a business guy just going to work every day. And next thing you know, I'm, I go into a restaurant and I think I see people's souls. I was like, who's, who's ready for that? I mean, that just doesn't happen in my life. And so I, I needed to talk to somebody because other things were happening too, you know, uh, like they say, you know, it takes seven to 10 years to integrate an NDE into your life. And there's a lot of other things that go along with the NDE besides just the actual dying part. You know, when you come back, things are different for you. And so um, I, I told her, I, I told my wife, I said, I want to talk to counselor. I don't want to talk to a psychiatrist. I want to find somebody that's experienced this, you know? So I got on the internet and I found the IONS group out of Austin and I got in touch with them and they had uh, the guy that was leading the group at the time, Ed Salisbury, he gave me a call and just immediately within 
five or 10 minutes of talking to him on the phone, I, w- I was fine. I, just, I, I knew right away, I knew right away he understood what I was talking about. And he just let me know. He said, look, there's going to be other revelations. There's going to be other changes that take place, but it's all good. Don't worry about it. You're going to be fine. And from that point on, I was, I was okay. You know I mean? There were the other things that happened and other and continue to happen, but, um, but I was okay with it because I knew it wasn't there, you know, because at first, the first couple of weeks, I was like, you know, what else is going to change? Does this last forever? There was just so many questions. And so I had a lot of anxiety with that. But uh, once I figured out that, that it was all good, it's here to, to help me and not hurt me. Uh, then I was at peace with it. You know? um, and, you know, I came back with the, some understandings about, you know, how, how God looks at us, uh, you know, how, how he wants us all to be with him. Um, you know, the, the thing about forgiveness, about how important it is to self-forgive and to forgive others. And probably the strongest message I got was, um, that, uh, we're, it's the message I got was we're overthinking things. And when I say we, I'm not talking about me. The message I got was we're overthinking things. We just need to love God and love each other and everything else is going to be all right. Everything else take care of itself. So then I. Something you end, heard while you, during your end of year after is a knowing or. Well, you know, it was a more of a knowing than a hearing. I can't actually say that. I can't actually say that I heard a voice and I, I really don't know. Uh, I, I, I can't say that I've ever met in anybody that had an NDE that actually verbally hear, heard voices. I'm sure there, there has been, but it, it's it's kind of kind of like a download, you know? It's just like you you understand this and you know it. I don't, it, it was communicated to me, but not, but not verbally. Does that, does that even make sense? Yeah. But um, anyway, I know it, I knew it and I still know it. And, um, and then that kind of, kind of took me on a journey to, you know, when I started thinking about it and I was like, okay, well then I wanted to analyze what love is and, 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 uh, you know, and, and, and the, um, you know, the conclusion that I came up with was that it's got to be shared. It's got to be an action. You know, if you just sit around and talk about it and think about it, it, it really doesn't have it doesn't have a meaning until you put you know hands and feet to it. Um, one of the things that I experienced over there was um, was the harmony that I felt. How I was just there was just this perfect harmony. Although I was woven together with these billions of souls, I kept my identity, but I was connected to something you know much 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 bigger than, than myself. And um, one of the things that kind of freaked me out too was when I came back, I didn't have a relationship to time. I mean, for it took me probably eight or 10 months to get my relationship to time back. And so you could tell me, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're going to Los Angeles in two weeks. I, I couldn't comprehend what two weeks was. All I could, all I could, I'd get up in the morning and all I, all I could visualize, all I could think of, or all I could comprehend was just that day. That was it. Anything behind me or in front of me past that was was not relatable to me in ter- in terms of time. And uh, you know, it's uh, it's just such a sudden and drastic change. It scared it scared me. You know, it's funny how we adapt to the ways over there. You know, the telepathic communication we notice when we come back, like when you walk in the restaurant. You just sense the souls and the feeling of the trees or the clouds or the sky and how everything's, I guess, is, you know, live there. And, and those um, downloads and those feelings, like, like we're in this environment there and we come back, it's part of it still with us. It seems like. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. I uh, probably for, for at least the first several months, I could, I could, I'd get up in the morning. Oh, this went on for probably almost a year. You could almost set your clock to it. I would wake up straight up at three, three a.m. in the morning every single night, and I'd be awake for about an hour usually. And uh, you know, I would pray, and I get in this deep meditative prayer, and uh, that would get me. I mean, that would get me as close as anything I did to 
to my near death experience. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't the same. It wasn't as strong, but it was it it got me closer to it. And then over time, you know, it's not as strong as as it, not near as strong as it was right after I had that accident. But I still I still one of my favorite things to do is just you know get up in the morning before my wife does, and it's just quiet and dark in the house, and just you know just get into deep prayer. How does it compare? how you were before this incident to after were you type person to pray or, or, um, or is this, you know, you were so more afterwards or. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Way, way more dedicated to, uh, you know, reading scripture and prayer. And, and, uh, I try to, I try to do, um, you know, I try to be conscious of doing the right thing. And, and I try to lend myself to other people to, when, when I can, probably not near as much as I should, but I try to, you know, be of some service to people. And uh, no, it's it's definitely, no, it, it it changed. Yeah, it changed me forever. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. And it irritates me when I hear people lump into ears all together and say things like, we're less religious or things like that afterwards. And I'm like, I don't think that's true for everyone. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely more religious. I read the Bible almost every day. I go to Bible study. I go to church all the time. And um, no, I'm very involved in that, in, in uh, th that part of my growth. You know, I want to know more. I want to, um, you know, I want to, want to break it down. I want to understand it. Um, and and I want to. And one thing that kind of aggravates me though is, in some some of the groups that I've been involved in. Uh, and this is a general statement because there's a lot of really good NDEers, NDE uh, motivated, uh, service oriented. Uh, I probably want to back up on that statement because um, most NDEers I know are uh, fairly service oriented and action oriented. What does kind of frustrate me, though, is people that are maybe outside of it are are curious about it is I get frustrated with the people that that sit around and theorize and want to know uh, just the conscious deal you know about if proven it scientifically I, I'm good with that if it's proved if it's proven scientifically that's fine but I don't have to know that either way I know what I know and and, and I know what I saw and I know what I feel and that's good enough for me you know I don't have to I don't have to have somebody set a monitor on somebody's body and say that a mist came out of their, you know, out of their chest when they took their last breath. That that's, you know, that's not going to prove or disprove anything to me, but. Um, yeah. When I interview I, NDE researchers, I mean, they're all different, but sometimes I feel like, do, do you understand I was there, <laughs> you know, yeah. you're researching and talking about something and you're coming up with these conclusions that I, I know aren't true. I died twice, both times is very different, drowning at five and ectopic pregnancy at 25. And so some of the things um, I instinctively just know, I don't have to go out and research and read a bunch of books. I just know what's not correct, you know, or what sounds right. And well, I think, I think too, one thing that kind of alarms me is, um, you know, people are so interested in what it's like to die and interested if there is a God. And, and, you know, a lot of a lot of people get really caught up in that. And a lot of people I've run into, too, I feel like they're looking for like a silver bullet or a magic pill, you know, and there's, you know, that since we had an NDE, we have all the answers and I want one, too, you know, so I can I can have the answer to life. So I can be God. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, right. and, and but what what bothers me about that is it overshadows. I think what what the NDE is really about, the NDE, in my opinion, is really about what it teaches us about living. It teaches mm -hmm. it teaching us about forgiveness, about inclusiveness, about, uh, you, you know, uh, self-love and love of others and service. And, you know, all those things, all those messages that are common to to most uh, near death experiencers is to me is the message that we need to focus on. And there's there's no, there's no, the silver bullet is, 
the silver bullet is is living your living a full life. You know, I mean, there 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 is no silver bullet. It's a process. It's not it's not a moment that everything changes for you. You know, people come back from NDEs and they still deal with lust and envy and greed and and uh, you know jealousy and ego. I mean, we still deal with all that. And sometimes it's even harder for people that have had NDEs because they're more sensitive to it. You know, and uh, so I, I, I just, uh, I, I want people to realize that, you know, look at the messages about love, loving your neighbor, loving God, loving yourself, you know, and, and what it means to put those, put those words into practice. That's, that's the real story, you know, and for somebody to go on a chemically induced NDE, so they, they think they're going to come back and they're going to have it all figured out they're they're going to be really disappointed because god's not there god's not in charge of that even atheists that say they have ndes they'll say i was told to come back I, okay who told you that if you don't believe yeah. in god who what is this well source okay but we all you know agree there is something in charge of this that sends us back that gives us the um experience it seems like that we were meant to have and the after effects and that keeps it alive in us that it helps us to not push it away forever because I pushed mine away for a long time, but you know, well, I think, I mean, you know, really when you, you think about the messages, uh, the lessons that people bring back from NDs have been around forever, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's since probably the beginning of time, there's nothing new. I mean, you know, love, forgiveness, uh, inclusiveness, you know, patience, all these things of kindness, all these things that were service, all these things have, have been written about and talked about for, for thousands of years. So there's no new message there. I think maybe, you know, part of the NDE um, phenomenon, if you want to call it that, is that we are just reminders of what's already there. You know, we get caught so caught, so caught up in in the worldly, the physical, that um, the material, that we lose sight of the spiritual. And I don't think we're coming back with any new information. I doubt we ever will. But I think we're coming back to to remind people, hey, this is who you really are. This is what you, what your your soul is about. The value to God is is not about how straight your teeth are, or what school you went to, or how much money you got in the bank. The, the the real story or the real value that God puts on us is our soul. And, uh, you know, if we don't understand that, and, you know, you always hear about the ripple effect, you know, we don't understand how we're all connected and woven together. We don't understand the, the, the effects that we have on other people by good or bad acts that we do towards each other. And then some people say, Oh, there's no bad, you know, there's no judgment. There's no hell. It's like, so you want people to think in the ears of having these experiences to show people that we can do whatever we want here and there's no consequence because, you know, there is consequence, you know, when other people are hurt. Yeah. Well, there's I've never heard anybody. That, I've never heard anybody that's had an NDE said that they, they were told just to come back and do whatever they felt like. I never heard anybody say yeah, that. Yeah. That's pretty much, you know, what I have been hearing lately that, you don't have to go to church. You don't have to pray. Uh, you don't have to believe in God. You don't have to be good. That Everything is fine that we all go. And, you know, they want everybody to have that. I think I call it false sense of security that we don't have to earn our way there. Cause you know, I do, I believe we have to earn our way there. That's just me. Well, you know. Well, I think, you know, from my experience, that harmony that I felt over there, we're being, you know, we're being tempered and we're being taught how to how to fit into that group, how to love, how to be connected to that group, how to surrender to the to each other and how to surrender to God, you know. And um, I was telling somebody it's like, you know, when I came back, I had this sens this sensation of, of this perfect harmony that was you know, that was woven through me and connected me to all these other people. And I'm thinking that um, 
there, there was a, a guy that uh, he passed away recently, uh, John Price. He was a Episcopal pastor and he had written a couple of books, at least one book on, on NDEs. And uh, I saw him giving a talk one time and he had this this board, you know, a, a marker board and it had, you know, murder. And he he, he uh, he's like, you know, just put a line through it. it. Won't keep you out of heaven. Adultery won't keep you out of heaven. Lying, you know, stealing all these different all these different offenses, you know. And then he got down to the very last one and it was pride. And he put a big circle around it and he hit it with that with that marker. And he said, that one, that one right there is the one that's going to keep you out of heaven. And so I started thinking about it. And I'm like, you know, I felt this perfect harmony up there. And I kind of equated it to a kid in school that was being disruptive, you know, and the teacher has to put him in the hall, put him out in the hall, you know, because because he's so uh, about himself that he he fights the he fights the the, um, you know, the togetherness that the, that every all the other kids have to have in the class. And I know that sounds pretty kind of, kind of a lame uh, explanation, but I think that's part of what if you're so prideful and you're so self-controlling and you're not willing to surrender to God and surrender to the other souls, you have to be, you have to be separated because it disrupts the harmony that, that, that exists in heaven. Yeah. The last thing I want is for NDEs to be used to promote murder and uh, uh, stealing and everything bad. Like, Oh, don't worry about it. Go do whatever you want, hurt whoever you want, because you're all going to go to heaven. So, I mean, I just, that's like, if that's, what's going to be taught and I don't even want to do this. This is yeah. the way I kind of feel. Well, no, I, mean, point? I mean, and God judges intent too, you know. I mean, if your intentions are bad, you know, there there is definitely a consequence for it. Now, that's not to say uh, when you're talking about just do anything you want and, and you're going to be okay. I mean, I, you know, obviously we're all going to have setbacks and we're going to have trials and tribulations in our life. But that's different than... than uh, put that's a different than than uh putting your brother or your sister in, in a in a bad position you know intentionally you know i mean like if you have an accident and accidentally hit somebody in a car that's different than seeing somebody walking down the street and, and jumping the curb so you could run over them i just feel like ndes are gonna are being used to dismiss the ten commandments like is that really is like is that where we're at now is that what we're doing? Yeah, I, well, you know, I'm not in agreement with a lot of that stuff, but um, I know like in our group that we had in Austin, I was there for, led it for a couple of years and uh, part of a group in Houston, I lead and, and with a friend of mine. And um, sometimes I get frustrated with some of the, not sometimes, all the time, I get frustrated with some of the beliefs that a lot of those people have. But it would never fail about the time I was ready to throw in the towel, you know, because of disagreement on my beliefs with somebody else's. Some Somebody would call me out of the clear blue and had had an NDE and was just distraught and and needed some help and, and needed a verification that they had act, what happened to them was real. And their family didn't understand. Their friends didn't understand. And, you know, a lot of these people were. Uh, you know, emotionally and psychologically in, in a really bad place. And uh, I, I don't, I guess it was God working, but about just about every time to the day that I said, that's it, I'm not doing this any longer. I'd get one of those calls and it was just enough to keep me going. You know, I'm like, okay, I'm not in agreement with all this stuff, but I need to be here for that person for, for when, when, you know, when that person can't find anybody need to be available for them you know yeah. this show was that for me today i was like i was just like ready through in the towel i was like and then i get a, a true into ear come on it's had a real experience and you know what they make of it later and what conclusions and what you know is up to them but um <laughs> i haven't had too many into ears i've had a lot of researchers and and things on lately it's, it's just the way it's just fell <sighs> Because it's starting to get exhausting um, when uh, it just seems like it's become a joke and they're using NDEs 
for to sell stuff, to promote their stuff, to try to sway people against religion or church. And it seems like everybody is using it for, and I, and I get in a visual of when Jesus on the Sabbath, when they were selling things on the Sabbath and he up, overturned the tables, you know, and it's just like, this is not where this is meant to be. And it started realization of that with me back several years ago when I first was in an IONS group in Columbus, Ohio, and I overheard the group leader say that she went to this certain um, local venue and spoke. And so I looked it up online. Oh, what's going on? And it had this stuff. And, and I looked over and I seen the people, other people were there. And I'm like, why are they putting NDEs in a circus tent? They're putting in with UFOs and um, home reading or psychic stuff or different things. I, you know, the paranormal. And then I've been struggling to find out why is NDEs always stuck with the paranormal? And then, you know, you have the churches that hate the near death experiences. They think they're false prophets. They're the devil. They're, and then, and then you can see why, because of all the new age stuff that is using into Eastern people away from church and, and Christianity. And, and so then you have the Christian near death experiences that only want Christian and they end up acting like they're prophets and they, and they have these visions of the future, like they're the new Messiah. And it, it's just all, it's like NDEs are just like on a shelf for display in everybody's store and used for different, is a product. And it, it just is, gets really old. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely turned into a sideshow, you know, uh, and I'm resistant to that. Um, probably, I'm probably um, not vocal about it, uh, you know, as, as much as I should be, but uh, I don't participate in any of that, um, you know, and, and if anybody asks me I'm, if I'm a Christian, I'll say yes right up front, you know, and I've, I've um, you know, run into that. Uh, I'd belong to that group for a long time in Austin and Austin's, you know, got a reputation of being very liberal. And from time to time, I would get drawn into a debate. And uh, um, I had this, there was a guy that was in uh, NDE that I knew he'd been, uh, uh, he was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, Mike Bongart. And anyway, I don't know if you know him or not, but anyway, I asked him one time, I was like, like, Mike, you know, getting drawn into these uh, debates with people about Christianity. And I said, you know, first of all, the people when I, you know, that have confronted me usually are kind of working off sound bites. Some of them might have had some kind of ne negative experience with church or somebody that was Christian, which, you know, can, you know, if that's not handled right too, that can be, that can be a, a weapon and, or, um, you know, if somebody's zealous, and they start condemning somebody. Well, yeah, it's going to turn them off, you know. And I can understand that. But um, uh, to a to a person, I've asked them if they've ever read the the Gospels or the New Testament, and I hadn't had one tell me yes yet. And so, um, you know, so I, I kind of look at that as maybe they don't know exactly what they're arguing with me about. But I've never convinced anybody to change their position, and. Um, I asked Mike about that. And he said, no, you're not going to. It's an irrational argument that they're having with you. And he said, all you got to say is, uh, all you got to say is that you're on a spiritual journey and you've chosen Christ to be your guide and just leave it at that. He said, you know, let, let people think about that and dwell on that because he were said, people, you're, it's. Were people in your group told to say, not, told to not say God or Jesus to use the word source? No, no, okay. no. Well, in fact, you know, myself and myself and another per person, a friend of mine, lead a group, and no, we would never say that. We'd never say I've that. I've heard other groups tell me, uh, people in other groups tell me they were told that. Yeah. Well, the NDE experience has definitely gotten hijacked. You know, uh, you know, there's like you said, there's a lot of people who using it for. Uh, you know, for self gain. And then there's a lot of people that are using it because they, they, 
you know, it's funny too, it's kind of a double standard. They say that we're um, intolerant, but they're intolerant of, of us. So, yeah. you know, and, and, and much more mm -hmm. so. Yes, you know. very much. Yeah. I can, I can be tolerant and it, that hurts my Christian views when they say things like, they are God and that um, to, that you don't need to pray and that you can be bad. You know, those things hurt my Christian views. But yet, if I say anything that even resembles, don't even offend theirs, if it even resembles, they think that's what I'm saying. Well, they're shutting everything down and they're on the war path. And they're, mm -hmm. you know, it's like we have no right to be Christian. Like everybody else has the rights for their the other religions and for the new age theories and whatever this month is the hot topic in the ions community to, to, you know, whether it's a ketamine or I don't know, the new thing on the block that they're talking about this month, you know, to force those well, theories. Um, but, but you better not say the Christian stuff. A lot of them will shut you down. Well, I, I you know, it sounds like you've, met a lot more hostility than I have. I haven't run into that kind of uh, up, you know, in your face kind of stuff. Some of the things that do, it's a couple of issues that do kind of bother me is uh, the deal with the mediums, uh, me, medians. And uh, I, I just don't believe in that. I never felt comfortable with it. I, we've, we've done a couple of, um, we've done a couple of, well, we've done three different symposiums a few years ago. We didn't allow we didn't allow any of those in our in our symposiums, you know, and I I just think that's dangerous. And I don't I don't know anybody that's had an NDE that uh, that you know in their NDE they were told come back and talk to dead people. I never have you ever had an have you ever talked to a near deather that's that was given that message that they need to come back and talk to dead people? No, no. So where does that come from? I've had several into ears say they could, they had their NDE and then they don't know who to talk to. And someone tells them to talk to a medium and suddenly they're channeling this and that, and they're told they're supposed to be a medium and they get clear off. I think of what the path, maybe they were supposed to be on. I don't know what path they were supposed to go, but it's just like, they just hit, like they find a way to express it. That is so, I don't know, off in my book, but. But yeah, the whole medium stuff, I don't, I've had several mediums on and I'll say, go ahead and read me. I have never found anything that was credible that they've said to me that would make me think, oh yeah, there's something to this. Not once. I, I, and I had one lady make the comment to me. She uh, believed in reincarnation and she said, oh, I goofed that up. She said, that's why I got to keep coming back. And I thought, Okay, do you think that you could come back a thousand times and you could ever be perfect, even if you came back a thousand times? No, no. They push it. Yeah. So I mean, if reincarnation, if the purpose of reincarnation is is to keep developing yourself until you reach perfection, that's in, that's not ever going to happen for anybody. You could come back an infinite amount of times and you'd still make a mistake. The only, the only hope that we have is just by the grace of God. It's just God's grace and that's it. You know, nothing we're going to do is ever going to make us perfect on our own. You know, including reincarnation. That's my that's my opinion. You know? Yeah. The main thing I have spoke out about, because I speak out about a lot, which a lot of people don't because they know they won't get invited to speak at conferences or groups or things. If they do what Peggy did, but that's uh, nobody's shutting me up, but my main beef has been the ones that claim to be mediums and say that they channel aborted babies and they all wanted to be aborted and they'll be reincarnated later is my biggest pet peeve of, of using ions to promote abortion. Wow. Been, wow. See, I, I, I stay, I guess maybe I need to be more involved, but I stay clear of all that stuff. And I stay clear of Everybody all that Everybody does, but me. I yeah. stay clear of all that stuff intentionally because I don't. I, don't really... I speak out. I, I do. I speak up and I speak out and I've made a lot of enemies. And I don't mean to, but I, I can't hold my tongue because it's just so not right. And I believe well, that I don't, it's I don't want, false witness I don't, against God. Yeah. Well, I guess 
I guess my position is, is I don't want, I don't want that kind of stuff influencing my group. I want to stay, you know, I want to, I want to be, I want to be here for the right reasons for my group and for the people that I can serve. And I, if, uh, you know, yeah. I don't want to get, I don't yeah, want to be obligated. Don't get to in. Most people don't. I kind of feel like the lone ranger out here at this point. And that's okay. I always have been. So, but yeah, it's, they're being used. And I, and I'm just at the point, like, do I want to continue doing this? Because I'm not going to continue to be a infomercial for people selling books that are um, telling people that um, they should turn against Christianity and church and that murder's okay. And abortion's okay. It's all good. Anything you do, it's all good. I mean, no such thing as hell. You're all going to heaven. It's like, that's what they're using Indies for. And then I think, what's the ultimate goal? There's got to be an ultimate goal. Like I said the other day, I was like, they're going to line everybody up and have them drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> you know, that that to go ahead, because we've told you how wonderful heaven is. We told you everybody goes. Nobody goes to hell, no matter what you've done. So do all this bad st stuff for us. And then, you know, drink the Kool-Aid. I, I just see it. I just see it not going anywhere good, but, but I see, yeah, it, I yeah. see down the road on things or a lot of people don't too. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that I, I and I mean, I've had, I've had some conversations with some people that you're probably talking about and I haven't been able to change anybody's opinion. No, I mean, I haven't you know, changed anybody. And, mm -mm. and then, and then, uh, you know, which is frustrating, but, you know, I'm not invited to, to speak at a lot of places. You won't you know? be because you're Christian. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I, 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 there was one conference I went to and my, my rating, my, my, my feedback that I got after my talk was like the best of anybody for the whole conference. And I, I'm, I'm not trying, I'm not saying that to sound like I'm bragging. I'm just saying that the feedback was really excellent. I had one lady that came up to me and she said, she said, man, out of everything I saw, because I'm, I'm kind of practical. I'm, I, I see things in terms of, you know, okay, how, how can we use this? You know, just to sit there and theorize and write books and, and, and get off into woo woo land. That doesn't impress me at all. You know, I'm, I'm worried. I'm like, Okay, how can I include this in my life? How does this help somebody? How does this help me? I, I look at this stuff as tools, not not just something that we sit around and you know read sayings off the wall and go, wow, that's fascinating, you know. But anyway, I want I want I want practical, usable stuff. So anyway, um, this one lady comes up to me, and uh, I think the to the topic of my talk was what what dying teaches us about living. And, 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 it, and I tried to put it in terms of, you know, the lessons that we bring back and how you can apply those to your daily life, you know? And so she was like, wow, that, that was, she said, it, it was at the end of the conference, out of everybody I saw here and I saw all the keynote speakers and everything, I got more usable information from your talk than, than anything I saw this whole time. Plus all my deals were good. I've never been invited back, never been invited back to talk, you know, then I, uh, so I don't know. It's just I yeah. got that too. I spoke at Ian's NDE panel in 2017 in Denver, and I was on a panel with four other. There's four of us, and I went last. And I hadn't told my story publicly before. I was so shy. I read my poems. I wrote about my experiences. They just come to me one morning. I don't normally write poems, and I read them. And people were commenting, "Oh, I love this more than anything." And and then I know other in the ears has been to conference that are Christian since then. And they hear that too. And I think that this is what people want to hear. I think I as misjudges uh, their ticket sales that by not allowing very many the Christian in the ears, they'll allow a few, but um, because I really think that's what that seems to touch people is, is actually the Christian in the ease. And uh, but that's not what the the direction they want to go. That's not their political agenda. So, yeah. but that, I, I'm not going to change them, you know. Well, I do, that... But what I do change though is um, by speaking out and is bringing awareness to my audience of uh, what to look for. Everything glares isn't gold. 
that to watch out for this, watch out for that. Now, some will say, oh, she's Christian. I'm not going to watch this podcast. Well, that's fine. Go watch something else. I don't care. I'm not trying to get views here. I'm trying to talk about NDEs. I'm trying to understand them. And I'm, and I'm a Christian. As you can see, I don't hide it. And, and they don't have to be a Christian to be on this show, but um, nobody has a problem offending me, though, knowing I'm Christian and putting down, you know, my religion, but yet standing up for, oh, well, there's Muslims, there's Buddhists. I'm like, but they're not sitting here interviewing you is what I'm thinking. So why are we even bringing this up? And 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 anyhow, yeah. So, yeah, but yeah. Well, uh, I, I love I love uh, hearing your story and I love hearing your after effects because that is the meat of the NDE that it needs yeah. to be the focus. Yeah, forget all that all that voo you know all the woo woo stuff and all the kumbaya moments and stuff. How does that feed a kid? How does that how does that save a soul? How does that speak to a kid that uh, is at home without a dad or a mom or in, a, in an abusive situation? Those are real things. Those are things that are real. And from what we get from the NDE, we need to uh, take action to to help out in those situations in a tangible way, not just not just you know not just reading a book about it. But one of the things too that along along the lines of just since we're kind of harping on frustrations is um, in that world. It's 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 kind of run by academia, I think. And in that world, unless you got a freaking pedigree with a bunch of yeah. initials behind your name or you've written a couple of books, you're nobody. And there's a lot of good stories I've heard from a lot of real people yeah. that do some great things. And and they don't have a Ph.D. behind their name or they don't have uh, you know, they haven't written two or three books and they get totally ignored. They get totally yeah. ignored. And then, they and think then they, people then care there's, about there's that, a, and they don't. Well, people, people that doesn't ha- that doesn't help anybody out. What is pretty is as pretty does. What it, what have they done for anybody today? And then there's people that um, that have been on the circuit for years, and they just regurgitating those people over and over again. Yes. I'm like, okay, we've heard Amy that was. guy's story. We've heard that guy's story ten times. Yes. And there's like so many other people out here that got that have great exactly. information, but they might have just been a they might have just been a store clerk at Walmart or something, but they've got a great story. Why aren't we listening to them? Why? Aren't, I mean, why can't we listen to somebody that we can relate to? Why? Do, you know, just because just because some guy didn't go to, you know, Yale or or get his PhD from Northwestern or something, what makes him more you know less important than somebody that did? Yeah, you know, in the conferences know. every year, the main speakers they have PhD and MA, and but who cares? Nobody cares. People Nobody want cares. to hear the stories. They want to feel it in their heart. They don't care about those degrees. And they say the same people every year. And some of the people are so boring and have not nothing to offer. Claim that they're an NDE researcher, and like I say, then the others just like you've heard them over and over. And then they have these uh, documentaries they make on NDEs. What do they do? They pick the same old people. Well, all you got to do is look at my channel. I've had a lot of those people on. They don't get very many views because everybody's heard it so many times. They're not well, interested and, in watching again. And another thing too, I always think about. I've I've been self-employed most of my life. I always looked at it like this, like I get up in the morning and I and I'm a little squirrel crawling out of a hole. I got to go find a nut. I don't have I don't have tenure. I don't have I don't have anybody that's guaranteeing me a paycheck every day that I would wake up for most of my adult life. I've had to go out and earn, earn a living just off of grit and wit, you know, and I'm thinking out of all these people with all of those letters behind their names. How many of them could have done what I did in my lifetime? And, and I'm not saying because I'm smarter or because I'm better at stuff or whatever. It's just from grinding things out, you know. I mean, just from, you know, just from being in the trenches and, and dealing with life. And I'm like, where's the where's the um, status in that? There's not any. Unless you got the initials behind your name and the books that you've written, there's no status behind a guy that just goes to work and raises a family. You know, which um, or, or or a single mom that working two or three jobs, she might not she might not have a PhD, 
But let me tell you, she's got some life stories, man. She's She's been down there. Yeah. Well, they kept telling me because I'm pro-life, that means I hate women. I'm like, really? You know, where were they when I were when I was uh, risking my life, getting women out of domestic violence situations, putting them and their kids in shelters? When I worked in a maximum security prison as a counselor, as primary counselor for drug addicts or emergency room, <laughs> you know, dealing with stuff you know, social worker, mental hospital, you know, foster care for 60 kids and the top to 10, you know, where were they? Where were yeah. they? Tell They're me homeless. I hate women because I'm pro-life because I can't stand the thought of an innocent little baby being murdered. You know, that's my flaw. That's my unforgivable flaw with IONS is that I'm pro-life. They said that you can't be in leadership if you're pro-life. And I had several groups. And so like, because they said, because you hate women. Like, really? What did you ever do for women? Yeah. 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 <laughs> might, have, might have wrote an article, might have wrote an article about it. You know? Yeah. yeah. May have wrote well, was a sentence in an article. Well, you know what? I, I, I feel, I feel your frustration. I feel your pain, but how do we take this and turn it into a positive? How do we take these frustrations in this, in this, Hell, and call it anger if you want to. How do we take this anger and 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 make something positive out of it? The thing is, is like you said earlier, you're ready to throw in the towel. There's only one one of you. There's a whole bunch of other ones. And if you don't hang in there and you don't do what you're doing, then there's no outlet. There's there's no um, outlet that that contradicts, you know, contradicts that other side. So you know. I hate to put this on you, but you kind of have an obligation to keep doing it. I know. It. I know I do. And I always have, you know, every, every job I've had, you've always got to this, this burnout f stage, you know, where you feel like there's the system, there's the people you're helping that I always loved. And then there was the system you're fighting against every day that is just corrupt and it's like here we go really in in the nde community i gotta fight this too like every, every job i've had i fought this and now this i gotta fight it too like i guess so i mean it's, it's just well, like well, everywhere but you but you gotta remember too peggy is that um you know you gotta keep in mind the people that that aren't fighting you you gotta pe keep keep in mind the people that do want your information that's what you're there for you know, uh, Satan's going to try to deter you at every corner. You know, you just got to keep the faith. Yeah, it's just as as you're the interviewer and then someone blatantly, as soon as they come on, just says, there's no God, there's no Jesus. You don't have to pray. You can commit murder. It's not bad. And I'm sitting here and like, and I feel like, Okay, one, if I just turn this off right now, I'm being rude. Two, I should probably just leave it on and let people see for themselves what we're dealing with, what they're doing with NDEs. Let them, let it show itself instead of me talking about it. Just let it, go ahead, show yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let how people do you see what the hell they're doing with near-death well, experiences. Ask them why do they feel that way? What, what gives you that opinion? Oh, they interviewed in NDEers and that's what NDEers all say. <laughs> well, you know what they do? They pick and choose. They pick and they have an agenda uh, that they want people to believe. And then they say, in the ears, say this. And they'll tell you how they. And, and I see it in groups, too. You probably don't know if you get on in the groups. I don't get on very much because of that reason is in the ears, say this. And when I first started having Facebook group years ago and starting to have in the friends, I was getting a lot of them. And then a lot of the audience people and they were. You should know Ned Matina would start. A, he's my first bully. You should know because you had an NDE that this and this and this. I couldn't get on there and say the sky's blue today without him jumping down my throat because you had always throwing NDE in my face because I had an NDE. I had to agree with him. He never had an NDE. You know, what does he know? He just he has, has a big, you know, Facebook group. And so, um, and then with him, he, before I even before that, even I was on his Facebook group and my first week on there, I think uh, someone private messaged me and was trying to sell me drugs. Said, you take this drug, you have a near death experience. So I contacted him because he was administrator 
and he wouldn't do anything about it. I said, he's, if he's doing this to me, he's probably doing it to other people. And I don't think he should be trying to sell drugs on your, you know, Facebook, in the Facebook group. And so he wouldn't do anything. So I just started talking about it on the wall and he started taking it off because this guy, he had this wonderful NDE, like got like 200, 300 comments. So it's like a lot of buzz for his group, right? So he likes that attention. But the thing is, the guy's telling me, and I'm sure he told others, that it was a drug induced NDE. And yeah. he did, he took the drug to have this experience. So it was crap. He was wanting me to buy these drugs. And I'm like, trying to report it. And it's like, they, they just like took me off. Like, well, that's not no that's, evil. Speak no evil. As long as we're not, getting the attention. Yeah, that's not an NDE. That was a hallucination. There was a guy, I, I've been several times to the Flyer, Fireflies uh, retreat up in St. Louis that Linda Jackman puts on. And uh, there was a guy there. Uh, we called him Dr. Bob. I can't think of his last name. Anyway, he was a physician. He was an MD. And he had, man, that guy had like three specialties. I mean, I've never seen a doctor that had that many specialties. And he was a, he was a, a genius, a real life genius. He, he had patents like on M, uh, parts that they use in MRI machines. And I mean, this guy was a um, guy. He was just a brilliant, brilliant guy. And he's had an NDE when he was a child. He was like, I think he was like 10 or 11 years old. He told me this story. And uh, and I asked him just straight out asking that question. I said, Dr. Bob, I said, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of buzz about and this has been a few years ago. There's a lot of bu buzz about um, people trying to come up with different ways to have a, a near death experience, you know. And uh, and he looked at and he looked straight at me. He said, he said, the NDE should never be. Uh, how do you put it? He said the NDE should never be performed in a lab. He said the NDE chooses you. You don't choose the NDE. And this is this guy is a scientist, scientist, a medical I physician, agree. medical physician. And that was his answer to it. He said that should never be never be replicated in a lab. Right. I agree. I agree. I agree. They choose you. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, we're given we're given what we need, and and for whatever reason, you know, we don't we can't we might not ever identify why we were chosen or for for that experience or or even even what the experience was for. You know, it might not have even been for us. It might have been for somebody else. You know, that we come into contact with. Uh, you know, there's there's unanswered questions, and just like all this stuff about, you know, the the scientific side of of the NDE, you know. And people, I always think people get so arrogant when they tr try to explain all this stuff. And I always think to myself, okay, there's this guy that's trying to explain time and life and space and consciousness. We don't even know what half the questions are. How do how does this guy think he has all the answers? We're 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 I mean, we're like the end of a pinhead in the in the middle of the ocean. That's how much we know about it. I mean, there's yeah. it's so far beyond us. And if I had Dr. I'm sorry, I had Dr. Raymond Moody on recently. He said about the same thing that, you know, these people think they have all the answers. He said, this in the East, he's just anything is that we don't have the answers and we never will. This is beyond our understanding. And that's where faith comes in. You're not ever going to know it all. And if yeah. you can't accept that, you're going to be, you're going to be prayed all kind of false teachings, you know, but yeah. Any, anyway, I, you know, you just you just get up and get up every morning and do the best you can. And, and, and uh, you know, I'd heard and I always tell this story about Mother Teresa one time when she was asked, you know, I'm supposed to do something great, you know, and it's been bothering me for a dozen years. And what is it? Can you give me some direction? And she looks up at the guy and says, yeah, just get up every morning and do what's in front of you. God places the opportunities in front of us. It's up to us to, to act on them, you know, That's but, true. uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, but no, I, I encourage you to keep, to keep doing what you're doing. I, I think, you know, it's, uh, there's gotta be an opposing side. And, mm -hmm. and if there's not, guess what? They've won. Yeah. I mean, I would I always wanted to be the type of person that just lets stuff just rule off their back, what people say. And, I'm, I've just never been that way. 
I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm outspoken, but it doesn't mean that I'm brave because it scares me to death to be outspoken, but I just, I'm very passionate about yeah. many things such as your death experiences, child abuse, you know, those kind of things, the things I'm passionate about, um, it's like all sense of security goes out the window and your safety is just like, they're going to have to burn me at the stake to shut me up because you know, I'm not going to shut up. So yeah, I've made a lot of enemies and I don't mean to, and that's not, I mean, I would, I, I can't go to the conferences, you know, I'm just like hated. I'm like enemy number one because I have spoke out so much and I, and I do feel bad, you know, every year it's like, gosh, I'd like to be able to go to that. I would like to be around other indie ears, I like to hear, th- but not, I cannot the way, the way it is and what they're promoting. I cannot, and I will not until they change. And if they don't change, then, you know. Well, they went so, they, they went so, strong, they went so strong in the mediums, you know. And I asked them, I said, how come y'all are doing so much of that stuff? And they're saying, well, that's what, that's what uh, people want to hear about. And I'm like, well, I'm people and that's, I don't want to hear about that. They don't. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to hear about, I want to hear the story about some farmer that lost his leg and almost bled to death. And you know, I want to hear his story, how it affected his family, what he's done with his life. You know, those, I want to, I want to talk to real people that have had real experiences. You know, I don't want I, I had a wanna... farmer on just the other day. It's like, you know, this is the kind of people I want to hear, you know, like you and like this guy, just everyday people um that have had these experiences because you know they haven't got their story out like a lot of them well i think probably they hold the key to most of the to the true meaning you know yeah uh, and then i hate to say it but i've i've heard some of these some of these stories uh from some people that have gotten relatively um famous i guess you'd say or got a fair amount of notoriety in them and this is a general statement this is not ever all of them because i've met some of them that have been around for a while and pretty but pretty well known that i feel are sincere and, and true to their uh-huh. message but um so, some of the some of the ones i've heard their their message becomes so canned you know it just almost feels like a sales pitch or something i don't i don't it just doesn't feel genuine anymore and, I, and, I think that, and I'm, they're going along with the flow, too, of taking God, Jesus out a lot of their story to make it more popular. Well, I speak in front of a group of young people every year, a couple of times a year, and it's a pretty good sized group. And they always ask me, you know, what your religious belief was and and what your religious belief was before and after. And, and, and you know, I tell them, well, I was a Christian before, but I'm more of a christian now and i mean i never try to sidestep it um the one question they do ask me though a lot of times is um what what i felt like when i was when i had my nde as far as any anything um, that i felt that was related to religion during the nde you know that would you know in other words was there uh, some people kept out of heaven because of because of their religious belief and i was like I was like, no, nah. to be honest with you, I, I can't say, I can't say that I did. I said, I did though, get this definite message and sensation that uh, God's desperately trying to get us all in there. Now, you know, uh, I don't, I, I can't say that I, I didn't, I didn't get any kind of feeling that God was trying to keep people out or limiting people i felt like he was trying he wants all of us there with him you know and i just wonder sometimes too and then people they'll ask me well what about people that that you know that have never heard of jesus and i'm like well you know the scripture says that you know you come to the father through me and i tell them you know maybe they didn't know jesus over here maybe maybe they that to get to the father you go through jesus okay but it's not saying that you have to go through Jesus over here. They might not get the opportunity to meet Jesus until they're on the other side, you know, but they're still going through Jesus to, to, uh, what is on my, that was a, a one oh, bug. sorry. It's a bug on my camera. That's what it was. Yeah. 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 But I mean, that's, that's just the way I answer that question. I, you know, there's a bug right on top of my camera. That's what that was going on. There we go. <laughs> See, there's a, 
there's a devil again. You know, we start talking about Jesus and the devil shows up. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I, you know, I don't know. That's just my opinion or just a thought that I had that, you know, yeah, maybe somebody didn't know him over here, but that's not to say that you don't get a chance to meet him over there. Well, I saw God and Jesus in my second NDE and I saw Jesus after my first NDE at five years old. And during my drowning, I did you mentioned earlier about most don't hear a clear voice. It's telepathic. I did hear a clear voice. I heard children. This is as I'm hovering over the pond at five years old after I drown. Children are sent here to be loved. That is why God sends them here. Hmm. And um, so I would ask them later, what part of my NDE did you think I wasn't Christian? Yeah, I, they were shocked that I was Christian. What did you think I was? You know, <laughs> I I tell you, I see Jesus. I saw Jesus and God during my NDEs and uh, or my second NDE, and and I, an angel spoke to me, you know, during my drowning and these things, and and somehow that was fine for me to be, you know, allowed to come up and talk about NDE panel. Oh, they didn't like my poems. My poems were very uh, Christian. I really mm -hmm. brought out my um gratitude um in my christianity and, and so I, later i was to go speak at a conference down north or conference a group eyes group in north carolina and the lady said you're not gonna read those poems again are you and somebody told me she's atheist she's running the ions group and she's atheist she was afraid i was gonna read those oh. poems <laughs> well, okay, i think that's a problem i think that's a problem with a lot of those groups they're they're run by people that aren't near deathers yeah, they're they're yeah. they are run. Some are run by actual atheists wow, that that's... have an agenda. That's they want to use thing. NDEs to uh, tell people that you don't have to go to church. To don't go to church. They they. I'll tell you what I see so many times is our study of NDEs show that people are like I said in the beginning are less religious and more spiritual. I'm like what is that, that even, is what even, that even not mean? even true. Huh? What does that even mean? What's that? Yeah, right. Mean? What does it even mean? And how's that even true? Like, okay, well, after my NDE, I didn't stop going to church. Uh, I wasn't suddenly spiritual. I didn't hear about NDEs for months. And then I didn't have know what they were called. I mean, I, I didn't know what it was called or even where we get a book for another two decades. So how was I spiritual? You know. Well, if you're spiritual, if you're spiritual, aren't you going to practice prayer? Aren't you going to practice learning about your spirituality i mean i, I, I don't they I don't meditate see therefore they're spiritual huh. i see it on facebook all the time they're putting down religion and bragging up their spiritual and if you say that you're a christian and they all jump on you and start bashing you and bullying you you got to be spiritual you can't be religious because religious people judge they're so afraid of being judged that's what this all boils well, down to well, let me tell you something we had a where, where I live over here on the Blanco River, we had a terrible flood a few years back. Washed away 350 homes. Uh, you know, there was like 14 people drowned that night. The guy lost his whole family. He got washed up on my neighbor's property. And they found his little boy's body on the other side of the river from my house. And uh, anyway, I mean, I'm talking about he lost both of his kids and his wife. He was the only survivor. And, he, and anyway, when they had people show up here, to, to help out, you know, with, with all the flood victims. I mean, there was a lot of groups down here for, for probably a couple months. And I saw one group that wasn't related to a Christian, to a Christian organization that was down here helping people out one. Yeah. Okay. If you're so spiritual and you're so good. What do you do? Where are you at? Where are you, at? you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm just like, I'm like, you know, a friend what? of my kids uh, was in um, oh, the learning disability special ed program for all his classes and his family kicked him out. He just turned 18. And I knew that if he didn't get to finish school out the school year, he would never get that diploma because it'd be really hard for him to get a GED. You know, so I I'm letting him come stay with us, even though we had eight adopted girls here. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, you know, putting them at risk of, you know, some sexual stuff going on. I went ahead and let him stay with some firm rules. 
And one day he called me out on our deck and he says, I need, he's, I really love staying here. And I really love you and you guys. He says, but you got to stop talking this Christian stuff. And I said, this is a Christian home. You know, I'm not going to change talking Christian stuff. And he's, but you really got to, because it's really bothering me and I don't like hearing it. And I said, okay. I said, uh, I'm trying to help you out. Once you get your degree, I says, try to tone it down. I said, I just want to say one thing. I want you to remember. He said, all right. He's what's that? And I said, in your lifetime, take notice of when you need help, who helps you? Is it a Christian or a non-Christian? Just keep, Mm -hmm. keep track. You know, who's helping you right now? And, and who's going to help, who helps you in the future? You know, say you, you, you need your side of the road and your car's broke down. Who stops to help you? Or, you know, who else is going to help you in your life? And I said, I'm, I'm going to guarantee it's going to be a Christian. So don't go be so worried and afraid of Christians because I guarantee there'll be ones helping you throughout your life. <laughs> Have you talked to him about it since? Yeah. No. He ended up getting sexually involved with one of our girls. And I said, sorry, you got to go. And he didn't get his degree. He didn't get his high school diploma, but you know, that no. was a rule. I had one rule. That was it. Don't mess with my girls. And he messed with my girls and it's got to go. Yeah. So. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You're right about that. You know? Uh, yeah. And a crisis, crisis send me a bunch of those judgmental Christians. <laughs> send me a bunch of those people that look, you know, and I mean, and, and there's some truth to that too, you know, we I, I have a men's Bible study I go to on Thursdays and we always talk about that, you know, how do you witness and stuff and what's the, what's the right way to influence people and that sort of thing, you know, I mean, when I say influence, I say influence, not manipulate, but what's the, what's the, you know, how can you get somebody's ear, you know, and there's that old saying to be, to have a friend, you got to be a friend, you know, you have to be sincere about it and you have to be consistent with it too, you know, but, um, uh, and they That's, say, well, they've been hurt by church. Like somebody did something to them, hurt their feelings. And I understand that too, that people can be mean to people because they're divorced. Because maybe their child got in some trouble or whatever. They haven't been to church in a while. And they show up at Christmas time and people snub them. You know, I understand people can be mean, even, you know, the Christians, they can be judgmental and they can be mean. And and they're not always, and sometimes it's it's the homeless guy that will, you know, offer your, offer his last dollar before, you know, a wealthy Christian too so i'm not you know saying that they're we're all perfect either size perfect but yeah i can't solve the world's problems i guess (laughs) no no, but but i mean you know no but i mean you know those are things you got to think about and you know because we want to do better and um you know you're right there is a lot to be said about that people that are with a lot of people that have are, are without are the first ones to step up and and do stuff for other people, you know, or, or like you say, give, give their last dollar. You know, we want to be that, we want to be that person, you know, whether we have money or we don't have money, we want to be the one that's going to, you know, that's going to do the right thing and is going to be a friend, you know, I, man, I, think, I, I, I think right now maybe it's more important than ever. I mean, maybe it always was important, but these times we have a people's doubt and confusion um, moral confusion is, you know, maybe it's never more important than now to stand up and to speak up, you know, like yeah. maybe I'm answering my own question. Like, do I just give up? You know, well, maybe it's never been more important than right now to speak up and stand up for what people believe are right. Because to me, people just want to, you know, don't want to get people mad at them because boy, they're, they're silencing us. You know, the liberals are really silencing the conservatives like you're racist. If you, if you're this, you're, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. They're horrible, horrible. They're trying to paint us it, and cover us with that looks like the bad people. And if we don't, you know, stand up and speak up and, and then we're just stand back and, and let them say it. I mean, it's just going to get worse. Yeah. But you know, the, the problem is you don't want to, the problem is you can't be self-righteous. You know, you have to do it in, you have to do it out of love for them, not out of out of ego. about you being right and and right. ego. It's got to be in, it's got to be given presented to them in, in terms of uh, somebody that's uh, that's wanting to wanting to help them, wanting to improve them. I remember one time, you know, you're talking about you did get a verbal. Uh, there's been a few times where I've gotten like actual verbal uh, hearings, you know, from God, and uh, one of them was one time I was praying you know, for God to, you know, to, for God to, uh, you know, shine his light in the, in the world. Uh, 
And it was just like somebody was on a megaphone and God yelled at me, you are my light in the world. I was like, oh my gosh, you're putting it back on me. You know, and it was like, you are my light in the world. You're my hands and feet. So I was like, okay, if we want God's light to shine in the world, we are the ones that have to shine the light or it doesn't get shown. You know, we, we're the ones that have to turn the switch on. We're the ones that have to be the, the flashlight in the, in the midst of the darkness. And that's our responsibility, you know, making, making disciples of all the nations, you know. But then there's always the question, what's the best approach? To how do I do that? You know, there's all these other things. How, how do I do it without being frustrated and, everybody. Dri yeah. and driving and alienating people? You know, you want to be effective when you do it. So um, sometimes you have to temper yourself. And sometimes more than tempering yourself, though, you have to ask for the courage to stand up when it, when it is time to stand up, to pray for somebody when they need a prayer, to give somebody a smile to hold somebody's hand to sit down and just talk and listen you know i mean all of those things are uh, can be awkward you know a lot of times you're, you're presented with situations where you're like okay this is my opportunity to witness right here but it, it, it's weird do i go up and ask that person that do i go up there and hug that person do i go up there and sit down next to them and just ask them how they're doing all these things can be weird and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but i got a theory about that too I think the more you put yourself out there and the more you do that, you learn from those situations. So if, even if you, even if you make a mistake, when you're, when you, when you're putting yourself out there, you learn from it, it helps you for the next situation, you know, but if you never, if you never attempt it, you never, you never gain, you never learn anything either. You, you never get better at it. If you never try it, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, you know, so Something you said prop the memory of uh, several years ago, uh, I got home late and uh, looked at my Facebook before I went to bed and it was somebody bashing me. They thought you're this, you're that, you're the, you're, I'm like, you know what? I went ahead and post us. You know what? This is what I did today. And I listed all the stuff I I went and helped this woman. Then she almost died. I went and helped this disabled person. The actual stuff I, what I did that day. And I just got home and I'm exhausted. And I see this, you're saying about me, you don't even know me. You don't, and you never spoke to me. You know, you've never set eyes on me. And you're saying yeah. I'm this and I'm that and that and that. Now tell me what you did today. You think, you know, <laughs> you're going to judge me? <laughs> I, I got a, they put it, they made a video. This was years ago. Uh, they did a video at that Fireflies conference and a retreat. And uh, they posted a bunch of them on, on uh, YouTube. That th so that thing's been up there for 10 or 12 years, I don't know, 10 or 11 years. And um, when I first went on and looked at it, there was, you know, there was some really nice comments, but then there was some really ugly ones too. And, oh man, it would, it would hurt me so bad, you know? And then, uh, and I would be upset with the people that wrote it. And I just thought they were disgusting and, you know, maybe demons or whatever, you know? And then, um, you know, I got to where I would, I would only pull it up and look at it maybe once or twice a year because it because it bothered me so bad seeing some of the negative stuff. And I looked at it the other day. I hadn't looked at it in a while. And I looked at it the other day. And I guess over time, you know, the way your attitude changes. And there were still some of those nasty comments on there and some stuff that was really crude. I mean, just really crude stuff, you know. And instead of being upset and angry or hurt, I felt bad for those people that were writing that. I, and I even prayed for them. I felt bad for those people that, that uh, I had, had sorrow, actual sorrow for those people that I thought, man, for somebody to write stuff like that, they must really be hurting, you know, they must really be in a bad place to have to get on the internet and, and say those kind of things, uh, you know, to write those kind of things. So I don't know, over the years, like I said, my attitude has changed and, and now I'm, I wouldn't say more understanding or more compassionate, but I just feel, I feel bad for him. I feel like, I feel like, man, somebody needs, those people really need somebody, you know, they need yeah. God. 
I uh, deleted probably four or five last night. And, and that's what I do anymore because I they used to bother me and I would react to them. And then I would be triggered the next person that said something that may not be so bad, but I'm already mad over these last five ones that I think they mean in this too. And I take it out on them. And so it's just for my mental health, I just delete them and I forget them. And because that helps me to continue to go on, because if I continue to read on that or try to think how to respond to that, and if it's still up there, I know everybody's reading this and, and people like to gang up on people. Like if they see one, oh yeah, I think that too. I think mm -hmm. that too. And, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, like a competition, how mean you can be. So I just delete it, forget it. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And it seems like when you get something like that, something like that, that triggers you, you just keep going over and over it again. I, I was, I was telling somebody the other day, I was, I was out sawing some wood with a chainsaw a, few, a couple months ago. And I mean, it was a, an all afternoon de deal. And I started thinking about something that somebody told me or de did to me 35 years ago. And I'm still angry about it. And I'm out there in the woods cutting this wood and it just started playing over and over yeah. in my head again. That guy lives three hours from here. I had myself so freaking worked up. I wanted to get in my truck and drive three hours to, you know, to cuss this guy out. He probably didn't even remember me, you know, <laughs> and I just stopped myself. I mean, I got myself so worked up and I just stopped myself. It reminds me, I, I saw your, your uh, video or your uh, chat with, um, Oh God, Randy Rampart. Is that his name? Remember. Anyway, it, it, he, he was an end of year that you did a, uh, did a interview with. And um, anyway, in his NDE, uh, he was at, he said, you know, help me or something like that. And he said, God's voice told him, well, have you asked for, have you asked for help? <laughs> and, um, and anyway, so I just was like, Oh God, I'm driving myself crazy. I said, please take this away from me. Please, please give me forgiveness for what this guy did to me. And I mean, just, just that fast, it was taken away from me, but all I had to do was ask, you know, and yeah, uh, it's amazing how we can get in that dark and it's like, we dig ourselves a hole and start bringing the dirt down around. And it's just like, it's like, we turn evil. I do. I, mean, I can feel like the evil. And I'm like, wait a minute. I got to pray and I got to release it. And the sooner I do, the better, because I will dig myself this pit of hell. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and, and for a while there, I think I was, I, I think for a while there, I was, I was enjoying the, the hate that I was, pro, you know, projecting on yeah. this guy, you know, internally, it was, you know, it's a spiritual battle. So it's all inside. And I think I kind of was uh, enjoying the sin of the sin of it. And then yeah. finally, I got so deep into it. I got to a point where I was just like, man, I need help. You know, finally, it finally, I finally realized where I was at and, and I, and I asked for help and it was, and it was given to me, you know, but, um, you know, I can, I can get up in the morning and, you know, and we were just, we're just so human, and, but I can get up in the morning and I can pray for 15, 20, 30 minutes and pull my Bible out and read scripture and, you just really get myself set up for the day and I can leave my house and I can be 10 minutes down the road and somebody cuts me off and I'm freaking right back where, you know, in that humanness where I'm yeah, you know, like honking at them and that stupid SOB. And, you know, it's like, uh, you know, we're just so, you know, we're just so prone to that, you know, I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> a month ago, I went to the movies. I had been really stressed out. And I told my husband, I just want to go to movie theater. And I just want to sit down and relax. And we always go like when it's not weekend, not an evening. So to avoid people, because I like to, I don't like a bunch of people around. I just want to, because I'm easily distracted by people. And I just want to just like chill and watch a movie. It's a Christian movie. And so I'm trying to watch this movie. And there's two women a little older than me behind me that won't shut up. <laughs> like completely will not. So I turn around and look, wouldn't change. Turn around, glare, nothing. So finally I said, are you going to talk through the whole movie? And the one closest to me said, maybe. <laughs> and I snapped. I said, well, maybe I'll report you. <laughs> I turned no. around 
And I was, then I'm, then I'm fuming. Then I can't concentrate on a movie at all. Cause I'm thinking, what am I going to do now? She just really pissed me off that maybe. <laughs> and so they just kept talking. And finally, before I even knew what was going on, I just yelled, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and some, and this is a Christian movie I'm watching. And someone on the other side of me behind went, oh my God. <laughs> like, I'm like the horrible person. And, but they shut up. I didn't have to hear another word. <laughs> But it's just like, oh my God, you know, it's just, <laughs> yeah, yeah just that's a, not my finest moment. <laughs> just a lack of civility, you know, just a lack of respect for other people. It yeah. seems like it's, it seems, you know, it's, it's getting, I don't know if it's because we're more crowded now or what's going on, but, you know, I just run into, into that attitude more all the time. You I know. think we're, I mean, I'm getting off topic, but we see so much on TV of the, the riots and well, not so much anymore, but we've seen a lot of it and we see the newscasters just bashing each other, the side and, and we see so much stuff like, oh, it depends what you watch, like YouTube of the, the Karen stuff. Oh, she's a Karen. And, you know, like you got a right to like be mean to this person. And it just seems like there's this mentality. I see our news too. Uh, people doing the dumbest things like somebody just read this morning somebody got in trouble at a their kid's homecoming dance because the dad didn't think this their kid should something and they had to end up on the ground arrested the dad and, and then the next story is something similar like somebody just went postal over nothing just yeah. going postal <laughs> like, gosh, I, I, like we're I, all I, on edge or something i don't know yeah yeah i don't know i think i think maybe even just simple stuff, you know, like the way, the way I was raised, um, you know, there's a lot of old, I guess, social rules that, that have kind of gone out the window. And uh, some of them are, you know, some of them you think, ah, oh, that's kind of, that's kind of stupid, you know, why would you even do that? And there are really a lot of them, there's no purpose for it. But I think basically the purpose for a lot of those old standard rules is you're just telling the other person by doing it. I see you. I respect you. You know, I, I recognize you, you know, just simple things like, you know, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, you know, taking your hat off when you go inside, all those, those, those are, you know, the proper table manners and things like that. It's not that they really serve a purpose other than just, just, you know, uh, acknowledging the, the, presence of another person and that you respect them as a person even if you don't know them yeah you know? i've lived here for about 40 years and but i've traveled with my husband different places for work and so i see the different ways people treat each other say at walmart or the grocery store and where i live it's just a fun thing i don't know if it's that way everywhere but because i know some places is not that we've been but if if you're in line and you look and you got half a cart full and here's this little old lady or anybody really with just a couple items. You want to go ahead, you know, yeah. yeah, sure. Thank you. It's just a common thing. And then, Oh, you got some more. Oh, well you go right ahead too. And it, sometimes it gets just to be funny. Just you know, how many people you let go ahead. And then other people in the back were like, well, I'm getting out of this line. She's there. But, but they, they were behind them anyway, but, and then, you know, yeah, just open the, holding the door open when you go in and out so people don't have to pull it. You know, there's just these common courtesies to, to, to look at the cashier and say, oh, you look tired or, or whatever. Isn't it hot in here? Yeah. You just make, I treat people like people and that's just how we live. But then I go to some of these other places, the bigger towns and nobody speaks the cashier. Nobody speaks to each other in line. Nobody's holding the door. And it's just a whole different vibe a culture. Yeah. 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 I know. It's kind of like, it's kind of like we're making each other invisible or something. You know, I was reading, uh, this is kind of way off subject now, but I watched this uh, documentary the other day. It's uh, how to live to be a hundred years old, the secrets of the blue zones and blue zones are places around communities around the world where they have a lot of people that live to be over a hundred. Oh. And, um, you know, of course there's some, some things with diet and exercise and all that. But they said the number one thing, excuse me, the number one thing was all of those communities were very sociable, very social. They had really tight knit uh, communities, spent a lot of time with their friends and family, participated in each other's lives a lot. The, the connection, 
the connection uh, that we have to one another was the number one factor in in the extended life, uh, you know, lifespans and, and their people, health. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, people can will themselves to die. I learned that in fifth grade. Our health teacher was talking about failure thrive one day. And he said, old people and babies can will themselves to die. A baby in an orphanage can have everything medically fine and everything nutritional and everything taken care of. But if nurses don't have time to hold them and love them, they just will themselves to die. And he talked, then he talked about old people in nursing homes, their kids stop coming to see them, whatever, they get lonesome. And they just decide, you're, and I worked in a nursing home right out 18 years old, right out of high school. And I, I saw that, I saw old people just will, and their family didn't come. They just, they were per, they was perfectly fine walking around and will give up with themselves to die. And so that, you know, my book is called The Will of a Wildflower. Because I got very interested in the will at, at in fifth grade about how what I'm, I'm thinking at fifth grade I'm like you mean to tell me we live in a country where people can't care enough about babies and old people that they're so lonely that they just die how come we're not doing anything about this you know about it and I just want to stand up on my desk and, and just start screaming and I think it was something that happened during my drowning at five years old I got this you know when God said um, children are, children are sent here to be loved that's why God sends them here. I was like, well, you right before that, he just let a uh, knowing that my family didn't love me. And so I'm like, well, why'd you tell me that? And after you tell me, you know, my family don't love me. Well, that's not fair. And I got this strong sense of injustice and, and everything we were talking about prior about ions and, and things, you know, it, it comes with that. It's like, I have this strong sense of injustice that I believe grew, you know, during my drowning and that it was triggered in fifth grade when I heard about the, the, you know, people willing themselves to die. And I just, I get like really involved and really wrapped up. Like if something ain't right, it's like, we just got to fix it. Like, I just can't be one of those people <laughs> just look the other way. That ain't happening. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. And I remember so many times there'd be something like in our business and people say, well, man, you better pick that up because uh, that could be a lawsuit there. And I was like, well, yeah, I don't want to get sued, but isn't your motivation that you don't want somebody getting hurt, you know, but now it's like everybody's yeah. more worried about getting sued than they are about somebody getting hurt. I, I remember one time and, and I'm just telling this story. I don't even I hate to tell a story like this because I feel like I'm bragging on myself and I'm not, I'm just telling this story because it's something that happened and just, I just happened to be the one there. Um, there was, I was in my business and there was a, a car wreck out in front of, out in front of our business. And, and, um, I just took off running and on the way out the door, I hollered back, you know, call 911. So I run out on the highway and this car had rolled over and there was a pregnant lady in there and I barely got to her. I wasn't there maybe a couple minutes and I was talking to her and checking out. I, I saw the baby seat and I thought there was a baby in there. That's what scared me. But luckily she just had the seat in there. She wasn't, she didn't have her kids with her. And, um, and there was a fire station that was just a block down the street or whatever. And they got there just, minute or couple of minutes after I did. But anyway, I stick around and make sure everything's okay. They get, you know, get her out and all that other stuff. And um, then I go back to the store and I'm walking in, I'm walking in and there's probably, I don't know, a dozen people in there. And, and they were obviously talking about me before, you know, while I, while I ran out there, I was the only one that ran out there. And, and they're like, man, you're crazy. You know how much liability that is when you do something like that. I thought you're talking about possibly saving somebody's life. And that's the, the first thought you have is that there's liability. If you go help somebody that's had a, a terrible car wreck. And it's like, what the heck is, what are we doing? What's going on here? You know, I don't yeah. know. I don't, I, I don't get it. Yeah, I think there is some law. I mean, it's here or there, but that protects people that help that try to rec to help. Their intentions are good in situations like that. But yeah, I surprised myself. I was the other person, and I never am in those scenarios. Here, a couple of years ago, me and my husband were in the pipeline, and we we're along a street in front of houses, and this old lady kept complaining her daughter more so complaining when are you guys going to be done? I can't get in on my driveway. You done yet? You know, you're going to be done tonight. You know, whatever. And so it's starting almost dark and we're still working late. And this uh, old lady come out on the porch. She started to yell at us and she fell on her porch. 
And one of the workers, young guy, jumped up out of the hole. We were, we were putting gas line in through there. And he jumped up out of the hole and started running up her porch. And I grabbed his arm and I said, I'm afraid you'll get sued if you walk up on that porch just because they've been yelling at us and we've been carrying on. Seemed like that type of people. Otherwise, I'm not usually, you know, I'm, I'm jumping in to help somebody. And I stopped him and I said, I'm not sure if you should go help. And he says, he looked at me, he thought about it and he went on up and he helped the lady up and everything was fine. But mm. I felt bad later that I stopped him. But because I did, I thought, of, oh, you're going to get sued because they were just like complaining. And it's a gas company. These are workers, you know, they're, they're thinking money. It, it, but I, I was afraid of him put his hands on that woman that she would yeah. accuse him with something. But everything worked out fine. But but yeah, yeah. I can. So I can yeah. see. But isn't that crazy that we live in a society that thinks that way? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what we can do about it. Yeah. And I even think that way too, like on my shows, like, should I mention this person's name? Should I mention this organization? I really want to get the public awareness out. I want people to understand. And so they can judge things for themselves better and not believe everything they hear and to understand some things are new age, some are not Christian or whatever. And so I'm like, but then, then I'm putting myself out here for a lawsuit. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. And sometimes things are important enough that like you say, you just got to go and the chips fall where they may. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got to be smart about things. You know, you can't be, you can't be unrealistic and naive. Yeah. You know, that's true. because then, because then, you know, you can put yourself in a position where you're not helping anybody. Right. Yeah. You know? It's a balance. Yeah. 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 Pick your battles. And yeah. It's a, it's a, in a town that I live in. It's like super liberal on one end and super conservative on the other. And it's, there's always some sparks flying around here, you know? And uh, just doesn't seem like there's a, it just seems like people are so determined to, to press, you know, to, to have their will done, uh, you know, on either side of issues, you know, it just seems like there's very little room for compromise, you know, and people are just, I don't know. It's just like everybody's, it's like people are all about winning instead of finding the right answer a lot of times. Yeah. I, I, there, I don't know of any liberals in where I live. I mean, it's mostly conservative and um, I can't say they're all Christians There's a lot of drug addicts and stuff too, but um, the younger, I say generation, but there's actually people my age that way. But anyway, so, so when I, so in 2017, it was when I spoke at Ian's uh, conference in Denver, I was also just becoming a uh, Ian's group leader and I thought they would be thrilled. Because someone down here in my neck of the woods, you know, us hillbillies, us ex, us conservatives, I I didn't know it was all liberal either, that I thought they would be like, yay, you know, someone that speaks their language, because they talk different, California, New York, and down south, than what we do here. And I thought I would be opening up in the east to this, like the Bible Belt here, that are probably still thinking it's all satanic and stuff. But that wasn't the case. They did not want this. <laughs> they did not want me and involved <laughs> they they want to keep things the way it is and so i thought well i don't care and and still i don't think i i, I bought property and i was going to build like a church for into ears and i got thinking i don't think it'll go here because people are probably still see it as satanic they'll probably still think oh near-death experiences that's against god they're gonna see just that one new age side of it and not realize that there are Christian into ears because I think we're few and far between it seems like. And it's crazy. Well, yeah. And I, there's, there's not total interest in that. It's kind of like, you know, people want to go to a cancer conference or something, unless you're having it or unless one of your rel close relatives has it right now, you know, how many people are going to show up for it? You know, uh, cause we did these NDE symposiums over here. And I, th well, I think one year we got like, like 325 or something one year, a hundred, one year, like maybe 175, but it's not, and we publicized it fairly well. There's not as much interest in it as we think there is, you know, people like to hear the story, you know, if they hear your story, they're, they're, they're fine with it, but they're not going to go outside, right. much outside of that. You know, they're not, they're not going to come to a weekly meeting. They're not going to come. They to can sit on a couch and pull up their phone and watch YouTube. Indies. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 your average person is gonna watch unless he unless they had a spouse or a kid or something that just passed away, 
your average person is going to watch three or four of those and, and maybe never look at it again, you know, or maybe read a one or two books and that's it. It's not, it's not as, uh, it's not as relative to most people as, as the NDE community thinks it is. But the NDE podcasts are popping up everywhere and getting very popular to sit and watch them. How many, Especially I mean, the but, ones I mean, that doing the graphics, the animations, the uh, reenactments. Oh, oh yeah, those, those, but there, there again, there again, you're, you're talking more about the, the sensationalism of them, of the accident and, you know, that kind of thing. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know. It's kind of like watching these murder mystery, you know, 60 minute shows or 2020 and stuff like that. It's more of the, you know, people get excited by the, by the crash, you know, and then they might think it's kind of neat that the guy went home, went to the hospital and recovered, but then they don't really care to know what happened to him six months from now, you know? Uh, yeah, I, I can see that. There was, uh, yeah, I saw a couple of those that I really liked, you know, and they, they because they told about the family and stuff you know i thought that was kind of interesting but Some people um, might watch them like they watch the um police brutality videos and the, you know the car accident videos it, people were just drawn to drama and and there's drama in our ndes you know even like you know you're kayaking you're in the pipe and you, you almost drowned and, and people want to hear that they don't want to hear this here like i'm sure we lost those people <laughs> there might be three sticking around you know when i post this that's still on but um but that's fine with me because i say i do i do these for myself and i do it for the guests as much as the audience and i don't care about views so yeah yeah the only thing um uh, time to go <laughs> Oh gosh, yeah, I didn't realize. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking a long time. So much fun, I didn't realize how long we've been on. But um, yeah, yeah, I do. I do have to get back to work. Okay, all but, right. Um, but well, I, it's been very I, interesting. This has been nice talking to you. Same here. I really enjoyed it. And stick with it. Okay. All you right. Know. I'll send this to you later. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know, it's it's it, a lot of times it's not about quantity either. You know, if you're hitting, if if you're if you're speaking to one or two people at a show that really need it, it's worth it. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, all right. Well, thanks. I'll Bye, Peggy. All right. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.